Thank you very much. But as we all know, making films is a real collaborative effort, and I want to make sure you know, I identify all the people who are involved in shaping this film. Uh, this film was really brought to fruition by Twin Cities Public Television, and the executive producer I want to bring up, Catherine Allen. Also, the executive in charge of production at Twin Cities Public Television, who, whose wife brought the book to TPT's attention, Jerry Richmond. <laughs> I want to bring Douglas Blackman, who's also a co-executive producer. The director of photography did a wonderful job with the reenactments, Andrew Young. My son, who's become a talented young editor, Jason L. Pollard. My two line producers, Daphne McWilliams and Nicole London. Our production designer, Tanya Rishi. One of our main actors in the show who played John Davis, Teron. Our composer, Michael Bacon. And two of our subjects who made this film took it to another level as far as I'm concerned. Sharon Malone. And finally, the very courageous Christina Comer. Questions, uh, Catherine, Doug, they love to answer questions. <laughs> no questions? Sir. I think we all did. I mean, that was a, a constant part of our conversation as we were shaping the film. That we knew that it had, you know, it had present day ruminations for what was going on in America today. You know, and, and you could not think of what's happening with the prison system in America without thinking about what this history was about. One of the things that I think was most powerful for me when I read the book and started thinking about this period was the branding of African Americans as criminals after slavery and that you know, that sort of identification, that feeling that there was something inherently criminal in African Americans that came about as, as a result of this was one of the just most devastating aspects of the whole thing. And when I asked somebody, why don't we know this history? Why don't we know this history better? He said, uh, people aren't interested in the history. We don't tell the history of criminals. And he wasn't, he wasn't saying this uh, in a mocking way. He was just saying that's, you know, a fact. We, Nobody cared about these people because they've been criminals, and, and that's why we don't know this history. Yes, Miss. Um, I have a specific question. Well, it's two. One is, how did you find people like Christina who are willing to speak out, who has a family of being oppression, and Christina, how did you deal with it, finding that out that your family history for your family and reality were not the same? Um, yeah, it's been... 
a journey, <laughs> to say the least. It's um, it's been a process. In fact, I'm still learning how to deal with it. Um, it's not easy being told one story in your childhood and even through adulthood, or most of um, my young adulthood, until the last two years. Um, I've just you know found this information out. It was only through the book um, that I found out this information about my family. So this narrative is a completely different narrative from from what I was told, and um, it's it's taken a lot of work. You know, I mean, it's taken um, a lot of counseling and good friends and uh, a lot of prayer and um, just you know this this team of people is incredible, and um, so it's taken a lot of support, and I'm still I'm still on the journey, you know, and still um, working with my family and talking with them and. And we're um, just trying to take it one step at a time. Just one other thing on that. Uh, after the book came out in 2008, at, at that stage, um, none of the descendants you saw in the film were people I knew anything about. Um, these were all people who, uh, who surfaced after the book came out and after they would see something about it on TV or read something about it, go to the book, and then I'd get a phone call or an email from someone who would say, yeah, I think I'm, my name is Bernard Kinsey. I think I'm related to that woman, Carrie Kinsey, you describe in the book. And out of that, for me, personally, as a writer uh, and a historian, uh, to, to make those connections into the present of these facts that had occurred 100 years ago, these living people who related back to these people that I spent years trying to understand, became one of the most powerful parts of the whole experience for me. And the same goes for Sharon Malone and, and, uh, and others, and the, all the Groomses and the Cottenham relatives. Both the blacks and the whites who, who, who surface in the film are all people who came to me afterwards. And, though, and they are across the board. People often ask me, do I feel, did I feel a, a sense of rage against the work that I was doing when I was doing research? Did I ever feel in danger? And there were some things like that, that there were weird things that happened periodically, like when we were banned from the one city in, in Alabama, uh, and the book banned from the prison system of Alabama even today. Um, but at the same time, there were these, these descendants who surfaced who just represented the most beautiful perspectives on American life and on why this history matters and also why history, even terrible history, doesn't have to cripple us. It liberates us into an understanding of how things came to be the way they are and what we need to work on as Americans now. So that's been one of the most beautiful things that I've ever done. Um, the photograph of the high school that the author went to, which was predominantly a black school, with, there were two white boys in that, in that picture. I just wondered how that shaped your ability to look at this history. And I'd also like to ask your son, son. yes, the editor, and perhaps the young black actor, what does this story do to you today? So those are two questions. One is to the author about the horrible experience of being the white boy in an all-black school, and to the young African Americans about what this history means. Well, it wasn't quite that horrible. <laughs> uh, but, uh, the, uh, and there are, there, are, there are two white kids in that picture, but only one was actually a basketball player, and that was me. Uh, and the other one was a manager. Uh, but the, uh, now, I, I didn't play in many games, but, uh, but I was on the team. <laughs> but, uh, <coughs> but I was in the, I was actually in the, this is hard to believe because I'm not all that old a guy. Um, but I was, I was in the first class of children in Mississippi to begin the first day of first grade, black and white together in public schools and go through the, in that class, the, the children who were the first to go through 12 grades of public education together. And in most of the towns in the part of Mississippi I lived in, all the white people abandoned the public schools immediately and went into the what we call SAG academies that popped up overnight for the white kids. Um, in our town, my parents, and my dad is here in fact, uh, my parents uh, made a brave decision to, uh, to try to make public schools work and stick to it. Um, so I grew up in that complicated world, but it was complicated, and it was, in fact, my next book, and I hope my next film, I'm looking for some support on this, um, uh, uh, is, um, uh, is about that experience, actually, um, uh, and what happened in that town and where that town stands now, and it's not a pretty picture of where it has gone, but it's really about how hard it is 
to make important changes in a complicated society. Uh, and it was a tough, it was a tough story, but it, it formed me, it shaped me in powerful ways. And I've been writing about race and these these things um, uh, for a long time now. Hello, praise God. Um, what it did for me, what it does for me today. <sighs> I'm still kind of taken aback from what I just saw because it's the first time I just saw the film, and uh, it's it's really just hitting me in a way that I didn't see before when I read the script. It's something when you read the script, then you actually see it come to life, and to know that this really happened is very <laughs> it's very emotional for me right now. But anyway, um, it allows me to see that for one how blessed I am today as a black man in America to have a history of a people who continue to fight no matter what the struggle is. And um, praise God. Um, a lot of times I know we go through struggles today in 2012 and we, uh, and we complain and we're struggling, we're fighting to to uh, get ahead or to achieve. And when you look back, <laughs> it takes a lot of prayer. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of standing. It takes a lot of courage in a place of fear. It really encourages me to go through whatever I'm going through today with all my heart and all my passion and knowing that I'm gonna leave a legacy for my children. I'm married, I have, a, I have a son, he's one years old, and this world is continually to evolve. And one day he's gonna look back on this film and see what his people went through. And he's gonna be able to see his father actually reenact one of them, and I'm gonna be like, <laughs> we can achieve anything through Christ. Amen, I'm sorry, I'm, we can achieve anything. I think uh, Saran pretty much summed it up, so I'll just say quickly, you know, editing this film and being around my dad, you know, with many documentaries from Eyes on the Prize to Four Little Girls to the Levees, and the great thing about documentaries is just you're constantly looking at history, constantly analyzing, constantly investigating. So what this brought to me was a history that I, I had not known, but, you know, well, you know, like everybody's saying, it just informs you of the issues of today. And it just informs you better and changes your perspective and, you know, allows you, it lets you, I'm losing my words, it changes your perspective and, you know, you just, you approach things in a different way. You know, when you see debates, when you hear politicians speak, you know, you come at it at a different viewpoint, a different angle. So uh, that was it for me. One other quick thing that's specific to this, um, you know, I, I actually, as of a couple of weeks from now, I will no longer be an employee of Rupert Murdoch, um, but, uh, <laughs> but at the moment I am, uh, and have been for the past 16 years, um, at the Wall Street Journal. And so I really approach history from a kind of economic uh, frame of reference, uh, not just one of social justice, but really trying to understand why things work the way they do. And the answer to that usually is money. Uh, and the... And so this is really an economic history, but the, specifically the way that I came to this story was in the late 1990s when there were these uh, lawsuits being brought by Holocaust survivors against German corporations that were raising this idea that had sort of been dismissed of that the survivors of the Holocaust um, might be able to sue the, the surviving corporations from that era for the abuses that had been perpetrated against them. And, uh, and so I thought, well, what would happen if we looked at American corporations through the same lens, with the same unforgiving perspective uh, that those cases were brought forth? Um, and that's what led me into this sort of inquiry uh, that d produced several stories, but one of which was about this place in Alabama where U.S. Steel Corporation, the most iconic corporation in, in really the history of business, uh, was a, and a Pittsburgh-based, you know, a northern-based corporation 
that was using black slave laborers in the 20th century. And so that's really where that began. Yes, sir. Um, George Lucas you know, recently talked about how Hollywood was uninterested in, in funding you know, his new movie, Red Hook. Red um, Tails. Red Tails, sorry. Um, can you talk a little bit about the funding process, what you had to go through to get funding for your documentary? Well, TPT did a yeoman like work in helping raise this money, and we all know up here how hard it is to raise money for documentaries, specifically historical documentaries in this climate. And uh, Catherine Allen and Jerry and the whole organization at TPT, they did a phenomenal job in prepping us, you know, putting together the proposal for the National Endowment of Humanities, going out, reaching out to foundations and corporations. They were really, they had their, their, their feet to the pedal on this. I mean, they did a yeoman-like work. And to get all the money raised to do this film like a year and a half is, is usually unheard of in, in, in documentary and public television. Jerry. I'd just like to um, add to what Sam said, uh, to commend PBS, our public broadcasting system. For the, this was one of the easiest pitches I ever made. Um, called up one of the executives, Sandy Heber, told her the story. She said, we're in. And uh, from then, they gave us our support in following uh, the money that Sam talked about, and then um, Corporation for Public Broadcasting, their diversity fund, were a big supporter, too. So I really want to acknowledge them. And also, February 13th, that's coming yeah. up very soon, 9 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Utah time. Um, it's going to be on primetime and PBS. So please tell your friends to watch. One more question, please. That's a pretty, there's a lot there, uh, but, but what that was a part of was basically that after Lincoln's assassination, uh, there was, you know, there was this great struggle that went on for decades um, in the country and in Washington and between the, you know, that, that president, Andrew Johnson, who's ultimately impeached, um, uh, uh, over which approach is going to be taken to what happens now to the freed slaves. Are they going to be made into real citizens? Or are they going to turn into some sort of freed serfs of a sort? And initially, uh, during the Reconstruction era, the, the side that, that calls for real emancipation and real citizenship wins. But, but it's against Andrew Johnson and these other, these other forces in Congress uh, immediately after the Civil War. But that battle rages on, and that's really what this movie is about, uh, is that over the next 30 or 40 years, there's this huge struggle going on in America about what's, what's going to be done with the black man. Is he really going to be an American citizen, or is he going to be something else? Uh, and by the end of the 19th century, Whites in all parts of the country, north and south and west, had pretty much decided that citizenship had been a mistake uh, and that it was okay for, for African Americans to be returned to the conditions that, that, the, that the documentary is about. Sam, I, I, I want to insert a question for Sam, if that's all right. Sam, I admire your work so much, and I want to know from you, what is your next film? What, what are the next stories that you want to be telling? Well, I'm trying to uh, raise some money now to do a documentary on John Coltrane and his music. <laughs> and we just submitted with uh, another public television station a, a major proposal to do an in-depth documentary on the life and the work of uh, August Wilson. <laughs> but I also want to make sure that we, we, we acknowledge the collaboration of the person who helped write the script and who was very involved in the production who couldn't make it here is Sheila Bernard. We want to thank you all for coming.